All right. Turn to Luke chapter 1. No one likes to spend Christmas far away from home. I thought maybe nobody would really like to spend Christmas grinding through Romans 7. So we'll go back to the Nativity story this morning. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. I'm going to make one very modest change in my reading of the text. There's nothing wrong with the text. My change has a purpose. I'm not trying to be trendy or cute, and I think you'll pick up on what I'm describing. Um, but otherwise, the word of the Lord from Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Miriam. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Miriam, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Miriam said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Miriam said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Well, a whole bunch of years ago, maybe over 20 now, I preached on this text, and if anyone is interested in a sermon that was more contextually sensitive, I don't know, that's probably on a phonograph record somewhere, but this morning I'm preaching an entirely different sermon on the same passage with a little bit more attention being paid to this story within the larger story of God's people. So I'm going to start with a different kind of introduction this morning. I'm just going to read different verses from the Old Testament. And the verses that I chose, and I chose them from an even broader selection, may at first seem random. But if you listen carefully, and if you were listening and reading along when I read the passage, you might begin to hear some connections. Genesis 6, 5 through 8. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. 
Genesis 16, 11. And the angel of Yahweh said to Hagar, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has listened to your affliction. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Judges 6, 12. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to Gideon and said to him, Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. Judges 13, 3. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to Manoah's wife, who becomes Samson's mother, and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. 1 Samuel 3.19 And Samuel grew, and Yahweh was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Proverbs 12.2 A good man obtains favor from Yahweh, but a man of evil devices he condemns. Isaiah 7.14 Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Finally, Micah 4, verse 6, In that day, declares Yahweh, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off a strong nation. And Yahweh will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth, and forevermore. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine passages out of many more. And all of these would have been familiar to an ordinary and devout Jewish person who grew up in the synagogue and listened to the scriptures being read publicly. And then again at home, where the scriptures were read within the context, maybe even not read, but memorized within the context of the family. You may recognize some of the references, others you may forget or wonder what the context was. But all of these passages are echoed in what I just read from Luke chapter 1. They are Israel's ancient texts some of these texts, most of them were ancient when Israel existed in the time of Jesus. Maybe we could compare them to our Christmas carols. Our Christmas carols, in a sense, are more than just hymns. Even when we hear the, 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 the first few notes of the introduction and we begin to sing the opening lyrics, our memories are awakened. The carols connect us to the past. Sometimes you may have a, some flash uh, as far back as your earliest childhood memories of Christmas. Our carols connect us to the church, for many of them are hundreds of years old. And in an odd sort of lingering way, the carols connect us even to our own culture when the Christmas hymns were seen, or were deemed anyway, to be valuable to the nation in our society. Well, the Annunciation, Gabriel's announcement, is doing something like that. It is woven through with clips, pieces from ancient texts that would no doubt conjure up memories and deep feelings. And they all suggest that God is beginning to stir, that God is now finally ready to act. So what did we hear in those verses? We heard about miraculous conceptions and miraculous births. We heard about dark times when saviors were born, during evil days, when 
one individual found favor in God's eyes. We heard about judges who grow up to deliver God's people, to save them. And the righteous, and the righteous, even when they are few, who remain loyal to Yahweh in the most evil times. And all of those themes, like so many streams, you know, streams running into a river, you've got to use that metaphor, they all come together one day in Nazareth, in Galilee, when Gabriel suddenly appeared to a young woman, perhaps in her early adolescence, to announce Jesus' conception. But now there are unmistakable variations on those themes. Variations that set Gabriel's message apart from the ones that came before. They're made even more noticeable when we line them up with Gabriel's message to Zechariah. Gabriel's message to Zechariah also includes many of those great themes from the ancient texts that are now organized again as God raises up John the Baptist. He represents, if you will, the end of the old. But Jesus represents the beginning of the new. And those themes have undergone a pretty extraordinary modification in his conception. There is continuity with the past, but radical changes are being made. So we could say it's the same, yet it's different. Maybe much like a person is before and after the resurrection of the body. Same, but different. I'm going to focus on three parts of the same but different this morning, and they will make up the three parts of my sermon. John's conception, if you remember the story, is a post-menopausal conception, much like Isaac's. Jesus' conception is virginal. John's conception recalls the judges whom God raised up to deliver his people in the depths of their most recent crisis. Jesus' conception recalls the kings, but he will reign forever. Notice the difference here. It's not the kingdom that will go on. Well, the kingdom will go on forever, but the focus is on the king. He himself will reign over that forever kingdom forever. And finally, while it is clear that John will grow up to be an extraordinary man in the midst of failing Israel, John is just a man. But Jesus, his conception is like nothing that has been seen before. And I'm going to use these three points of comparison and contrast as my three points this morning. Picking up with the words of Matthew, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Matthew then shifts his attention, of course, to Joseph. He comes out on to center stage. But in keeping with the way that Luke elevates women in the early church, his interest is in the young mother, Miriam. And so my first point this morning is Gabriel announces a virginal conception. Gabriel announces a virginal conception. It is a matter of biology 101 
that a male must join with a female, even now in the modern world if it's carried out artificially, before the female can conceive a child. The female produces the egg, the male provides the means to fertilize it. All moderns know that virgins do not spontaneously conceive babies in their wombs. But back in the first century, back in first century Palestine, people also knew that virgins do not spontaneously conceive babies in their, in their wombs. We may know in the modern world so much about the how because we can study it at the, you know, the subatomic level, certainly at the microscopic level, but first century people were as sure as we are that virgins do not conceive babies without a male. They were as certain about that as they were certain about that dead people do not come back to life. We can't chalk this up to some ancient gullibility. So that even in little Nazareth, Nazareth at the time was about three and a half football fields by ten football fields in size. Population 480. 480 people. Gabriel greets Miriam with the shocking news that she who does not know a man, which is actually how verse 34 should be translated, it's just a footnote in the ESV, she will soon become pregnant. Well, what do we know about Miriam? Nothing much, at least if we confine our knowledge to the canonical sources. If, if later rabbinic Judaism is a reliable guide, to first century, early first century Palestinian life, and if Miriam and Joseph were the typical young couple, then we can conjecture. Miriam was between 12 and 14 years old. <coughs> she had reached, or at least was about to reach, the age of sexual maturity. Joseph would likely have been an older man, well along in years, 16 to 18. <laughs> and in this visitation, the two of them were in a year-long betrothal. Now, if you go to the, the Renaissance art, in which Miriam is always portrayed as a mature woman, and she's wearing... The, the clothing that we associate with the Madonna, the same basic elements show up again and again. It's always the painting is divided in half and the, the angel occupies one half and Miriam occupies the other half and there's some representation of heaven, often like a beam of light extending down toward the woman. There might be a dove in the beam of light. In one, there's a little infant in the beam of light, as if the baby Jesus is coming down to visit her. But one thing stands out to me as I was looking at these. Miriam is doing something when Gabriel appeared to her. She's reading. She has a book. She has a book stand. She has a scroll on the book stand, or she has a more conventional book, as if she were a pious student of the scriptures. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's much better to see her as more of a peasant girl who worked the land and served her birth family as was appropriate for those who were born female. She probably even retained her Galilean accent when so many years later she sat down with Luke and recounted the narrative of that special day. 
We want to make her what she was, a flesh and blood person. She was not full of grace, which is the translation of the Vulgate. She was not full of grace in order to be a source of grace for others. She was simply honored by God, who looked on her with favor and singled her out for a distinct and unique privilege. This, I think, is the context for Miriam's question. How will this be? How will there be a conception since I do not know a man, since I am a virgin? Calvin scolds Miriam here for her little faith. But I don't see her question as some attempt to put limits on God's power. Not like Zechariah. Zechariah knew the story of Abram and Sarai by heart. So when he says, you know, how is my old wife going to ever conceive a child? The angel is kind of frustrated with him as if, what are you talking about? That's the whole foundation of your story. And he is disciplined for it. But Miriam knew what we know. Virgins do not spontaneously conceive babies. And this is what I mean when I say the same but different. God's mighty works to save his people have left a visible trail in redemptive history. All those Old Testament passages that I read, for instance, are part of that visible trail. So a miraculous birth story fits a pattern. But now there is a brand new layer being added to that pattern. And Luke puts the two scenes side by side to represent the change from the old miracles to the new, to an on a whole new plane miracle that can only be compared to a person dying and rising again. And that brings me to my second point this morning. A virginal conception for a God-man. A virginal conception for a God-man. Gabriel describes Jesus twice, once before and once after Miriam's question. First he says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So the child will be born, and he'll be called holy, the Son of God. So what do we have here? Son of the Most High plus holy, plus son of God, what does that add up to? While son of David can stand in for son of God, which is not necessarily a divine title, son of the Most High, El Elyon, that is a rare title for God in the Old Testament. He is to be the Son of the Most High. El Elyon. Beyond just one psalm, it only occurs as a full title, God Most High, in Genesis 14, in the story of Abram meeting Melchizedek. So we're not prepared for this. It is a title, it seems, that lifts the Son of David all the way up to God's right hand. It's not unlike that remarkable name that Isaiah described where we're caught off guard because the names are so extraordinary. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So both passages, Isaiah 9, Luke 1, they're both slightly opaque. But we can see them clearly enough to see that there's something new going on. To see that Miriam's baby, conceived when the Spirit comes upon her and when the Most High's power overshadows her, is no ordinary male. And I would suggest that it's at this moment that the outlines of Jesus' deity are forming in the Gospel accounts. As with a virginal conception, so with a divine man, there are no existing categories for such events and such persons. There are plenty of mighty, spirit-filled saviors all throughout Israel's history, but as with the post-menopausal conceptions, they can only point at new realities that go far beyond all that we've seen and heard in the Holy Scriptures up to now. God is about to become a father. Not, of course, in the broader creational sense, not even in the narrower redemptive sense, but through a conception in Miriam's womb to which he contributes the power of his Holy Spirit. This is mysterious. This is holy. Perhaps it belongs beyond the curtain to the Holy of Holies. It is better described than dissected. We did so earlier. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, who, for us and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. By the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. We confess it but from a safe distance. <clears throat> Our confession says mostly the same. Being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance. <coughs> it took a, the church a few centuries to work all of this out and then excuse me, to choose their words carefully when they put them in creedal form. But one thing we can say about our text and the outlines of a divine man, there is an extraordinary work coming that calls for such an extraordinary man. And that's my third point this morning. A God-man for a forever kingdom. A God-man for a forever kingdom. As we saw in Isaiah earlier, then in the reading from chapter 9, as we saw in Micah, both of these prophets foretold a kingdom that, once it was established, would remain fixed in place from this time forth and forevermore. It is a forever kingdom. And so it is fitting that the Most High Son will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And as Miriam will celebrate in the Magnificat, 
This is all traceable back to God's original promises to Abram. Now, there have been many kings and judges that have served God faithfully, if imperfectly, by saving and then ruling over his people. But their best efforts never last because they never last. Who, for instance, according to Jesus himself, is greater among those born of women than John? Yet John dies in jail. It is the same old, same old. A burning and shining light extinguished by the dark powers. But no more. And listen to what Jesus says right after those remarks about John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. How can that possibly be? That means, assuming you are all filled with God's Spirit, that you all are greater than John the Baptist in his earthly ministry. Do you feel that way? How is that possible? Well, in the same way that our resurrected bodies will be greater than these bodies, and greater than our first parents' bodies, even while they were in their innocency, there is a continuity here that is the same but different. The law and the prophets were until John, Luke will say later on. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. The earthly Israelite kingdom was always eventually spoiled by its kings. But even in its decrepit condition, it was always pointing beyond itself to this forever kingdom, where David's son and David's Lord will sit at God's right hand. And if a faithful Israelite any time along the way in the story paused to reflect, he or she might reason out within the context of the story, of course God's kingdom must be a forever kingdom. Because our God is not like the nation's God, created by the nations and for the nations. Our God is an infinite, eternal, and forever God. <coughs> and this is what Gabriel's announcement to Miriam represents. Its fulfillment, but what a fulfillment. This is new creation. In fact, this, the very presence of the Holy Spirit here is a message that this is something new and different. And the Spirit plays a very notable role all through Luke's Gospel and, of course, into the book of Acts. This is new creation. This is God about to make all things new. And it all started in Nazareth, in a young virgin's womb. It's as if God is smuggling His Son into the world through a side door to confound the world and all of its so-called wisdom. And this is perhaps our very first hint that there is a cross on Jesus' horizon, a baptism that He had to be baptized with, which caused him terrible distress during the years of his earthly ministry. It comes up soon after when Simeon comes to Miriam herself, and he says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and then maybe looking her in the eye, with some sadness, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. 
But Miriam's youth and her poverty were not able to rob her of her faith. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I am the doule of the Lord. Doule has come back into popular use because it's a word, I think, uh, for midwives. It's the female form of slave. I am the Lord's slave, she says. <coughs> Let it be to me according to your word. <coughs> this is Abram-like faith. God speaks and she believes and submits to his word, even at great risk to her own name and reputation. So Miriam begins this new era in redemptive history like her great ancestor began the first era in redemptive history with belief in God's nearly unbelievable world. Word, excuse me. Perhaps we can say then that Miriam is the mother of all who believe. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are reminded at one level once more that there is nothing impossible with you. <coughs> if you can divide the sea, if you can create life in the womb of a dead woman, if you can do all the things that you did to Egypt through Moses, then surely you can allow your own son to be conceived in the womb of a virgin. This is new life and new creation, and we are thankful for it. And so, our Father, may we have faith like Miriam's, that responds to your word that brings about a natural spiritual submissiveness. It's very hard to do that. But we have models of it and we have the Holy Spirit who can bring it to pass. And we're thankful as well that the child was called Holy, Son of the Most High, and His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all the glorious benefits of it, its justice, its righteousness, its harmony, the ridding the world of sin and the elevating of your great name, they are all wrapped up in this moment when our King is about to be born. We are thankful for him and for his willingness to submit to that baptism which he dreaded in order that he might retrieve us from those prisons, from our debts, from the misery of sin, from all of our bondages, to be his own brothers and sisters in your kingdom. And now we pray, Father, as we turn to the Lord's table, may we receive his bread and his wine as his body and his blood finding life here, the one who came to life in Mary's womb, giving life to us at the table. Bless us at this table, we pray. For we pray it through Christ. Amen. If we were to collect the promises made to Abram into one promise, because in a sense the promise develops a little bit over time, it is, Abram, I will make you a great nation through a son, a seed. That is a son who will come from your own flesh and a son who will come from your wife, Sarai. And Abram believed God, 
and he credited to him his righteousness. And now a messenger from God comes to a peasant woman in Nazareth, a girl really, and says, Miriam, you are about to bear the very Son of God. God is making you the mother of God. And she submits to that with faith. Extraordinary words met with extraordinary faith. Similarly, here, we have trays with pieces of bread and then little cups in another tray with wine and grape juice. And we say, this is Jesus' body and this is Jesus' blood. It's not that I perform some type of miracle that makes them into something they are not. But by the words of Jesus, which we receive with the same kind of faith, his body and his blood, which is for us, which is for the forgiveness of sins, and which seals that everlasting covenant for an everlasting kingdom. And so as we come to the table this morning, we do hear extraordinary words from God. How is it that bread can be the body of Christ? How is it that wine can be the blood of Christ? Well, we've made efforts to explain that, but at some basic level, it's appropriate that we just receive it, for it is given to us as a gracious gift to encourage us in our faith and strengthen us in our journey. If you are not a Christian this morning, then you don't have the faith to receive Jesus Christ in the bread and in the wine. You must first receive Him as the Savior and the Lord before you are eligible to come to this table. But to all of those who call on His name, as the name of the Lord and Savior, come and receive His body and His blood, for it is life everlasting for us.